On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. And while they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? And they stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priest and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who are with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. And then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then he interpreted for them the things written about himself and all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. And when they came to Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he were going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. And after he took a seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? And they got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and their companions gathered together. And they were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. And then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, inspire us with your true and lively word that we may know more of what it means to be your children and that we may faithfully respond to the call of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one in whose name we have gathered and the one in whose name we pray this day. Amen. So many of our holidays include food, don't they? They include being around table, around breaking bread of some kind. Fourth of July is not really any different. There's fireworks, but of course there is always some food. I want you to turn to your neighbor for just a minute and share what is one of your favorite foods at Fourth of July festivities. Okay, so what are some of them? Watermelon, I heard. What else? What? Other food? Hamburgers, hot dogs. What? Somebody? What? Mac and cheese, okay. None of y'all named my favorite. You see, when I was growing up, Fourth of July meant going to my aunt and uncle's lake house. It was one of the few holidays that when we went and gathered with all the family, we got to go just as we were. We got to be casual because it was all at the lake house. And the lake house, even my aunt, who was normally, well, pretty prim and proper about all things, and like when we went to her house for other holidays, the china came out. That wasn't the case at 4th of July. At 4th of July at her lake house, Suddenly, my aunt, who was always dressed up, well, she dressed down. She was in jeans or shorts. My uncles, they always fried fish. And that was my memory. And there was something different on 4th of July when we sat around the table together. 
Because you see, suddenly on 4th of July, when we sat around the table, all the rules, all the things that I was worried about breaking or not breaking, all the things that caused me to have, well, a little bit of stress on other holidays, we didn't have any of that. All our family gathered together, and when we broke bread and ate fish, in that moment, it was as if we could all see one another, see one another for who we really were, see our hearts. We were real. There were no pretenses. That's a little bit about our story today. It's about the fact that the disciples, the disciples finally saw Jesus when he broke the bread. The story is, I just read it, you heard it. It's one of those where the disciples, y'all, they were disappointed. They were downcast. All of their dreams had seemed to fall apart, fallen apart. And they had even decided to go home. They had been journeying with Jesus. Now, these are not the disciples who are counted among the 12. These are others who had followed and journeyed, who had witnessed the crucifixion. And who had placed their hopes that Jesus would be the one, the Messiah to redeem Israel. And yet, it all had fallen apart. And so they had decided to go home. And on their way, as they journeyed, it's one of those where it was on their path to Emmaus that a stranger joined them. And he journeyed with them. They didn't recognize him, but they talked about their disappointments. And we hear those powerful words, those heartbreaking words. We had hoped. We had hoped things would be different. And it's in the midst of that that Jesus then begins to interpret the scripture to them. Jesus begins to tell them all of those things about faith and about Well, about really living with God. But they still don't get it. As they get near Emmaus, they encourage him to stay. And I think they encourage him to stay because they wanted to have more of what he had. Their hope was gone, and yet still somehow he seemed to have hope and faith. And so they invited him to stay. And as they were preparing for dinner and gathered around the table, he took bread. He took bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. And they recognized him. They recognized that Jesus was alive. They recognized recognized that their hope wasn't gone. They recognized that their hope was alive. And it's interesting because in that moment when they tell Jesus it's too late for him to travel anymore, they get up and they run the seven miles back from where they had just journeyed. And so as we come to the story today, I think there's some questions for us and some affirmations. And the first affirmation is, The affirmation that hope, hope is alive even in our times of disappointment. Hope is alive even in the midst of our disappointment. Have you ever had those times when you've uttered the phrase, I had hoped things would be different? When maybe a dream is lost, a job is lost, A transfer comes in. A relationship is lost. A promotion doesn't happen. When there is the death of a loved one. And you say, I had hoped. I'd hoped it would be different. 
in those moments of disappointment, in those moments where we feel like all hope is lost, Jesus reminds us that sometimes hope is still right in front of us. We just don't recognize it. I love the passage of Scripture that comes to us from Romans 5. It says, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. We can face disappointments in life. We can face moments of despair and grief. But God's hope is bigger than any of those individual moments of those seasons of life. God's hope is bigger than our circumstances right now. Those who founded our country knew this. They knew this and they shared it with others. You see, they had a hope for freedom for all. They had a hope that was greater than just the circumstances of the day. Because if you read the story of our early nation, y'all, there was a lot of suffering and despair, of uncertainty, of loss of dreams. Even our national anthem. Our national anthem is an anthem that was written about a moment of hope. It was the War of 1812. Fort McHenry. Ships were being bombarded. And the dawn began breakthrough and Francis Scott Key saw the flag the flag and he penned these words I won't sing them for you oh say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight Or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. In moments when our country feels so divided and there is so much struggle and strife, the flag is still a symbol of hope for freedom for all and for us to stand with courage about the truth on which our country was founded. Hope is alive, even, even in moments of our disappointment, our despair, and our grief. Hope is sometimes right in front of us when we don't even see it. And hope, hope is founded and shared in the breaking of bread. We see that in the story. That's when they recognize that hope is alive in the breaking of bread. Our sacraments come to us in the simplest of forms, in symbols of water, of baptism, in bread that receives and offers us sustenance for living each and every day. 
There's a wonderful story about a woman named Naomi. She was in the Albuquerque airport. Her flight had been delayed for four hours, and so she was just walking through the terminal, and she heard over the loudspeaker, if there's anyone who speaks Arabic, will you please come to gate 4A? And she knew that was her gate. And she also knew she spoke Arabic, but she wasn't real sure she wanted to share that information with other people. It's not always well received these days. And yet she chose to go. She went to her gate and she saw as she walked up a woman crumpled on the floor. She was in traditional Palestinian wear. And crumpled there, she was wailing, wailing loudly. And The flight attendant says, Naomi walked up, came to her and said, do you speak Arabic? And she said, yes, sort of. And they said, can you say something to her? We told her the flight was delayed and she fell on the floor and she's wailing and we don't know what's wrong. In her broken Arabic, Naomi talked to the woman, finally got her to understand that the flight had been delayed for hours, not canceled because the woman thought the flight had been canceled and she had a major medical surgery the next day. She had to be in El Paso. As she began to settle down, Naomi began to think of all the people she knew who spoke Arabic. And then she also asked the woman, who was supposed to pick you up? And she said her son. And so Naomi called her son, let them talk for a little while. And Naomi told the son, I'll stay with her. Naomi thought of her father who spoke Arabic and handed the phone and let her talk to her father and found out they had mutual friends, so they called some of them. For two hours, Naomi just let her use her phone and talk to people in Arabic, and the woman began to settle down and calm down, and the hours began to move by. And after about two hours, Naomi said she suddenly started reaching in her bag. She pulled out cookies, homemade cookies, Mamul cookies covered in powdered sugar. And she offered Naomi one. Naomi took it and began to eat it. And the woman began to offer it to all the other people at the gate. Naomi was so afraid that everyone would turn her down. And yet she said no one declined. She said we all sat there sharing these amazing cookies. And we all had powdered sugar all over our clothes, all over our hands, all over our mouths. She said before long, the airline decided to start sharing beverages with everybody there. And she said suddenly, suddenly everyone was laughing. A four-hour delay that turned into a moment of celebration. People from all different places, speaking different languages. And yet somehow in the breaking of the bread, hope, hope was born again. That's that's my prayer for you and for me throughout this month as we share in this worship series. That we might go and break bread or share cookies with someone that we don't know, and that hope, hope may shine through a little brighter. Finally, I think the question comes, how will we respond to this this hope, this living hope that is among us? The disciples, they ran back. You heard that. Even in the darkness of night, they chose to run seven miles back to Jerusalem to share the good news, to share the hope that they had found again. What about you and me? How are we going to not only recognize the hope in our midst, but how do we share that? Yesterday morning, I had the wonderful opportunity to go and welcome a family to Frisco. It's a single father. His name is Ender. He has three children. They just arrived from Venezuela. They're seeking asylum. I was 
invited to come and meet him because Bed Start Ministry, which we often partner with, they were delivering all the furniture for his apartment. And so I went and quickly realized I don't speak Spanish and he didn't speak any English. We have a wonderful member of our church who was packing for a trip, but while he packed, he got on the phone with me to translate. And as he was on speakerphone and Ender and I communicated, I realized how overwhelmed Ender was with hope after quite a few months of despair. We shared some more and got furniture in place and everyone else left. And before I left, Ender looked at me. The phone now turned off. And he simply said, Amigo, and I understood that. And I said, see, sí, amigo. And then he got out his phone and he typed, and he had a great translator on there. And he typed in something in Spanish that then he shared with me in English. How can I help you? And then it translated, how can I collaborate with you? That was his response to hope. His response was wanting to collaborate with you and with me, with our church in this community. And so we will seek ways, not only to continue to welcome him and his family, but that he might teach us something about what it means to break bread with someone we may not know the language of and may come from very different traditions. But my belief, that's where hope will be born. Not only for him and his family, but for us as well. It was in that moment when I knew Christ was present. There's an old rabbinic tale of a rabbi that goes to his students and says, how do you know when night is ending and morning has begun? And one of the students said, I know. You know that night has ended and morning has begun when, when you can look across the pasture and you can tell the difference between the sheep and the dog. And the rabbi said, that's a great answer, but not the one I'm looking for. Another student said, I know that night has ended and morning has begun when you can look at leaves, when the light is falling on the leaves and you can tell the difference between the palm leaf and the fig leaf. And the rabbi said, that's not what I'm looking for either, but it's a good answer. And they finally said, Rabbi, what is the right answer then? And he said, you know that night has ended and morning has begun when you can look in the eyes of another human being and see them as your brother and sister. That's when morning breaks through. I believe that as we break bread together, that hope will shine through, that God's light may shine through, and that in that moment, we will see one another truly as brothers and sisters, part of God's family. May we celebrate this week. May we celebrate the freedom that we have been offered but may we do so knowing that it is given with the gift of hope that that freedom is not just for us, but for everyone.